Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 571, that's 571 con mi or para, whatever, whatever that term is, your host Agostino Zynga. My Spanish is really, really rusty, I need to sharpen it, I need to sharpen it. Thanks again for tuning in by the way, it's been a barnstormer. What have I been up to as per usual? You know me, hanging loose, hanging tight, doing the best that I can, running bears, going to the gym, drinking loads of water and trying to keep this body as tight as can be for the summer months that are approaching. Some may say it's already summer but I've still got two more months left. Let's get this body banging, let's get ourselves skinny and let's enjoy what we have left of the year but yeah apart from that how have i been um pretty decent it's been a pretty hectic weekend for me i think most of you guys if you are tuned into my youtube channel you would have known i did a couple of live streams over the weekend both of which went really terribly you know one went really well another one went really terribly because my computer just ended up dying and um, i think for whatever reason my macbook air tends to like you know get a little bit hot and bothered under the under the hood so when you try to stream late so when you try to stream later in the day when i've been using it the whole day it just can't handle the stream so it ends up dying so i ended up having to shut it down start again on my work laptop that that, that ended up working so that was pretty good for the time being but most likely i'm gonna have to update the ram on this but then what's happened as a small update with me tech wise and equipment wise the macbook pro that i fixed the 2013 one the one with the cd drive that i fucking swear by it unfortunately has died so i think in general the motherboard of that computer is just kaput wherever you put the ram i guess that compartment must be damaged because it just doesn't it just it just kaput um all the hacks i've done in terms of helping it work in terms of slip sliding a little plastic card under the ram slot so it kind of lifts it up and hit and makes it hit the connectors it doesn't work after a period of time it just comes loose or it just gets those weird kind of fuzzy sort of symbols on the screen so I'm either so I'm pretty sure either the motherboard is just corrupted over time because it's a pretty old laptop that I've had for literally years that's held me down for a long time, or it's just the, the slots where you put the actual RAMs are corrupted. But I'd rather just buy a new a kind of newer one that's in better condition off of eBay. They're like one fifty. You can get them off somebody and just start from there because my hard drive is still fine and just kind of swapping my hard drive and I'll be pretty much ready to go on that front. So I'm not too bothered when it comes to that. But it's a shame because I was counting on using that to stream and whatnot but maybe maybe going forward i should just stop fucking around and just get my streaming laptop that i wanted to get for ages i've got a long list of um ones i want to buy um i think they're pretty much affordable to get but you know i don't really stream that often outside of my dj sets and the odd live stream i do called the random show where i just talk about comedy store stuff i mean comedy scene stuff and whatnot and random clips i find online so i'm not too sure let's see what what goes on but i probably need to get that done sooner rather than later or just decide no streaming until i get the best equipment you know what i mean um because running it on like shitty equipment or having it not work properly is just not the vibe and then the other day i got it to work but then what i ended up doing I was using one of those um, headsets with the with the microphone attached to it. It's pretty decent, don't get me wrong, but I put it right close to my mouth, and I didn't know, I didn't realize how much I breathed really, re I, like what's I nasal breathe and just breathe in general really hard. I guess some of you on the podcast may have already noticed it if you listen to my voice long enough, but I never noticed it. The same way how I never noticed I flipping have a nasally voice before I got my surgery done in terms of my nasal polyps. But I guess I was breathing really heavily in between watching clips. I didn't mute the mic and people were just going crazy in the chat and I couldn't see the chat. <laughs> it was just a bit of a mess. So I need to kind of get my bearings done in terms of streaming. But all in all, not too shabby, I'm not going to lie. It's quite entertaining putting on a live show for people online. Um, you know, keeping them busy for a couple of hours because I know for me, I found it difficult in my spare time to find things to watch and do. So sometimes you just be on YouTube or Twitch and you'll stumble across a live stream that you don't really care for and just put it on the background so you've got something to kind of keep you quote unquote company. It's very weird. I know some people do it when they go to bed too. I've heard of some people putting on TV shows and putting it really low or putting it just barely so you can hear it. And then they'll just have that playing on the background and go to sleep. Like I remember who used to do it. I forgot who used to do it. Maybe it's my mum. I forgot. Someone used to do it. Like they'll put on like Animal, like an Animal Planet or Discovery Channel or something and just have that playing in the background. And that kind of gets them in the mood to kind of sleep. I know for me back in the when I was super young, um, who was his name? Oh, I forgot his name. Is it David Hockney? Is, it, is that his name? I think it was David Hockney or something like that. I forgot the guy's name is. No, it's not David Hockney. He's a flipping artist. What's his name? I forgot the guy's name is, but the white guy that plays with the guitar, he wears like a beret. 
um, pretty old dude who used to wear Vizzin back in the day. I remember, remember he used to have there'll be random concerts of his on the BBC playing, and I'll just have that on in the background, and that would send me to sleep instantly. So it's mad because whenever I see his face, I always think of going to bed. But anyway, what can you do? What can you do? Um, apart from that, what's I been up to? Oh, I went out on the weekend. I went to Mix Garage to um, go and attend a party called um, Howl. It's sort of like a, um, it's actually funny that party. It's actually a, if I'm not mistaken, it's a brand that kind of makes um, fetish kind of wear. No, no, that makes basically kink equipment, whether that be like lube and all that sort of madness, right? Um, and they also put on pretty fun parties where they utilize every single space nook and cranny that exists in the um, color factory formerly known as mixed garage and it was a pretty mad one so they have like a main and and i think this time i went as well what they do really well they had they changed the stage around so usually when you go into a mix usually the dj is on your left hand side this time they had them in the middle of the actual whole place um they had these little dark rooms upstairs they had um chill out spaces different rooms like crazy stuff man like really crazy stuff i'm not going to lie um but very very interesting to see visually and i got a bit of a i won't say of a wake-up call but it was a bit interesting to see the difference in how people rave when it comes to going to like queer gay lgbtq quite lgbtq type nights i've never really had any separation in my mind between going to like a party in like you know village underground um night tales uh pickle factory oval space um you know corsica studios and then go into one of these kind of you know what would you call them alternative quote-unquote nights i just thought they were all in the same thing and i thought if anything being somebody who wants to pursue his djing career on the side and also somebody that's a fan of the music and a fan of the scene it's just interesting to see how different people put on different types of parties and the people that come out to see those parties and the djs that play those parties and all that sort of stuff that's really interesting because if anything that's really stands out as a difference maker between london nightlife i've always said in any other place in the world is the amount of genres you can go and see and the amount of subcultures you can go and immerse yourself into you go to certain cities berlin being the biggest example it's pretty much one tone techno 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 and you're going to see the same type of person at about blank that you're going to see at the city force that you're going to see at you know, city force maybe not good as an example but you know what i mean about black Bergheim, all these places are going to have the exact same person at all these kind of venues whereas i feel like in london you could go to a metal night you could go to a hardcore night you could go to a pop punk night you could go to a northern soul night like every single flavor disco house deep house take house whatever you want you can get it basically you can get your needs catered to and um, grime funky uk garage and there's different people there in all these different spaces so you get to see a different sort of you get to see a different side of london via the prism of the, the club nights you go to but i never understood how some people are very strict and very dismissive of certain things like they will never go to a tech house night because they hate tech house whereas i think there are still good djs in that scene you just hard to find them because most of it's shit right i, I still think there's something there to be seen so i would like to see a good one a good version of it i still think maybe it's bad to say because they probably wouldn't like to say it but even though it's more minimal but the toy toy collective that i went to the toy toy music right they put on pretty good nights and you'd imagine they're probably in the same sort of sphere as tech housey type things but i'm open to going and seeing those different things in it and i got a bit of wake up call when i went to how um at the at the color factory because i was standing in a queue waiting to go in just before like just after 12 or something or maybe before 1 30 yeah 1 30 i don't know one of those times and there was a couple in front of me i was like chatting to and having a bit of cube banter with and then you know out of nowhere they, they got you know no out of nowhere we got towards the front of the queue and then they just left and then didn't really say nothing i was like, okay and i was like went to the bouncer before i went no what's happened to the couple behind in front why didn't you let them in he said like, no we weren't to let them in we just told them informed them that it was a gay night and they said they didn't want to go in and i was like oh jesus christ that's a bit wild isn't it imagine going to a club and then them saying hey this is an afro beats night and you're like nah no thanks don't want to be around the dark it's just like what it's a bit insane isn't it so i never understood that that was a thing i i didn't know people wouldn't want to go to a gay night 
they wouldn't want to go to a queer night they wouldn't want to go to an lgbtq plus night a lesbian night whatever you want you want whatever you want they just wouldn't want to go to it because it's not something that they want to be surrounded by but if anything i feel like going to the same type of parties the same type of places and seeing the same faces it kind of takes the fun out of club culture and part of the reason why club culture was fun and interesting you think back to those iconic pictures of studio 54 was because you got to see different types of people all sharing the same space obviously the whole reason why that place ended up closing was because of the velvet rope right the velvet rope ended up kind of killing that space because it became too exclusive too friend of a friend and it didn't let regular punters in as easily as it did before in the start but the whole premise behind studio 54 was the ability to sort of like democratize clubbing right to allow people from the highest of the highest of society and the lowest of the lowest to share a space to get jiggy get down enjoy some fun pop some quaaludes and have a grand old time and they just kind of represented what club culture is about in the day right a kind of neutral space where we can all kind of let go of our worries politics whatever it may be um views on the world and just kind of enjoy ourselves on the dance floor as we kind of get guided through the night via the djs the vjs the lighting people blah 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 so i never understood the real I never got the whole like separation thing but again maybe because there's so much options you can actually choose you can decide hey i don't want to support this i want to support that because that's also a great thing because it felt like beforehand um there was no support for these kind of alternative quote unquote nice i'll call them um so that there wasn't any incentive for the club to put them on either because there wasn't a market for them or partners for them but don't get me wrong even though this place wasn't as full as it needed to be i still think the reason why it wasn't super full was because they had everyone spread across like three different rooms but it was still a pretty decent turnout for a easter weekend which was full of events even just around the corner of the yard it had another event going on too which was i think if i'm not pretty sh if i'm not too sure if i'm not i'm um, speaking out of turn i'm pretty sure it was in that same sort of world right so um that was great to see obviously the club kids are amazing i went in there as a photographer mainly so i took tons of pictures i'm hopefully going to get developed very very soon so i can't wait to show those off that's going to be pretty good and um yeah man i'm having a good time i'm not gonna lie like it's been nice to go out i think someone messaged me the other day about it about how it's nice to go out and just be sober and just like enjoy the flipping ambience of the place you're at it's decent don't get me wrong but you get very much a the other side of sad the bad thing about going out sober is that you get to feel more social cues than you would feel you wouldn't feel if you were drunk and high so you get to kind of realize okay who doesn't fuck with you who thinks you're annoying who do, i mean you get to like you get to see it you have to be more attuned to it than you would if you were just kind of drunk and high and not paying attention so that's the only kind of let down on it but um it is nice to go out like just sober and just kind of enjoying the night as is and um taking pictures was also a, a good thing because it allowed me to kind of be a roaming quote-unquote reporter just kind of viewing stuff from the sides but usually when it comes to going out to those type of events i try to keep myself i won't say far back but i try and take a step back a bit i don't try and come in as being as overbearing as i usually am when i go out because you know i've got a pretty big personality and i can sometimes take over an entire room and suck up all the oxygen so i don't want to do that and you know it's basically i'm a i'm a guest in their space for you know for lack of a better term so i want to be mindful of that and also just want to make sure everyone feels comfortable in around me because i'm pretty sure the cis gendered um vibes and waves are flipping emanating from my body like flipping magma do you know what i mean so it's pretty evident to see that <laughs> So if any, the last thing you want is to make people feel, uh, you know, weird, they can't feel comfortable around you. I don't, I never want that. So that was pretty decent to go and take pictures and just kind of be around it as a kind of a sp a spectator somewhat, as a reporter, as a scene guy or whatever. That would be quite cool. So maybe who knows in the future, that could be something I continue doing. It was something I did for quite a while prior to going out. I used the kind of photography thing as a way to kind of shoehorn my way into the scene and just get familiar with people um that's how i'm you know became friends with the guys that used to run love fever one of the best parties you know i went to for a long long time but unfortunately they end up falling out and i think they do different things i forgot what that guy does um i forgot what his name is but he does another party but yeah that, that was one that's how i basically got interested in the scene by being a somewhat photographer guy that would take pictures of club nights and send them to the promoters and let them do what they wanted with it innit? um and all i really asked for at the time was just basically entry to get in because i'd be willing to spend money on the bar i'm willing to do whatever else i'm gonna do when i get in there so i don't need to be kind of um given everything for free but just the ability to kind of go in, especially if it's a popular night is always sick and then just you know be able to roam around take pictures on my film 
film camera for people who know so it's nice as well obviously asking permission as per usual and just doing the damn thing but yeah that was basically my weekend and of course united against norwich yeah who cares really i, I didn't really watch the whole match watch the second half a bit embarrassing to go you know to allow norwich to score two goals at home um but you know it is what it is i'm waiting for the end of the season can't wait to eric ten Hag to get confirmed and then for us to kind of move on because this season has been a drag and absolute disappointment to say the least just in terms of not even in terms of trophies <clears throat> sorry and finisher positions but mostly just because of performances the performances are being so lackluster um i think we were sold dreams because of the names of the players that we flipping bought the likes of you know varan sancho ronaldo we thought we were gonna just see better football i think i don't think anyone was expecting us to be top four you know st you know confirmed finishes but we just want you just wanted to see more exciting football something to kind of get our bed for something to remind yourself to go home for to watch it's just not not that at the moment so the quicker the season ends for me the better the quicker the season ends the better anyway jump on this show let's get into it and talk about some things that i've been experiencing in this jam-packed cultural week so first things first i've been checking out a show called tokyo vice and i really recommend you check it out it's on hbo max but you can find it whenever you find shows and you stream online i don't know what you do out there and it's a super interesting show for anyone that's a fan of stuff like gomora in that gomora is like an insight or like a yeah like an insight into a culture into a you know criminal movement you know, organized crime in a certain sect in a certain area in italy obviously in sicily and you get to kind of get a kind of a look into how it kind of goes on through these kind of real you would say representations of what those people are like through the actors that they use some of them are mostly i think most of them are actually kind of amateur actors that they actually got from the streets who kind of did that as their sort of first gig or people that weren't that well known and it was a great way to kind of um, lift the lid on all that organized crime going on back in there right and I feel like Tokyo Vice does the same thing for Japan and Tokyo, of course. Um, it's based on this guy who wrote a book called Tokyo Vice also, who was a journalist who happened to be one of the first foreigners ever to write for a very prominent newspaper out there in Japan. This prominent newspaper had a very particular way of reporting crime and organized crime and all those occurrences that happened in Japan and Tokyo with the Yakuza. And it wasn't very detailed. It wasn't very investigative. It was a very kind of um, this happened, this happened, that happened sort of way. Very black and white, very cold and no real follow up. He goes there, obviously, being an American that he is with his savior complex and wants to kind of uncover everything and just kind of see how things work over there and kind of gets given a kind of guided tour and gets basically taken under the wing by a police officer who's also kind of got a bit of a dodgy past, a dodgy history, a dodgy relationship with organized crime. And through telling the story, basically, they're telling the story of organized crime through the prism of the reporter, through the prism of the detective that he's kind of shadowing through people that he works with in the newspaper through relationship he's having and also through this um club where these girls are the hostesses right i think they have the it's a big thing they have over there in tokyo where you go to a club a girl will host you you know pretend to be your girlfriend basically pour you drinks light your cigarettes entertain your chat and then obviously you pay them a fee and um he kind of sees um various what various kind of ways people kind of interact and live in tokyo with this organized crime sort of cloud hanging over them in the yakuza and how it basically affects them in different sort of ways and it's ridiculously illuminating so much so this is the kind of show that immediately will get you opening a new tab getting on your phone finding out what yakuza is about the history of it organized crime suicide all this stuff like you'll be digging deep into it when you watch this it's really really illuminating and one of the things i like about it too is a tiny thing but it's something that i would kind of really appreciate because i love when it i'm a big fan of anything thrillers right when it comes to thriller stuff i'm a big fan of it but obviously when it comes to stuff involving you know um cops and robbers in terms of police dramas in terms of organized crime stuff like it's just all i'm all over it like high stuff i'm all over it for the longest time i was obsessed with the pink panthers this organized crime unit um or basically this um robbery group you would call it a robbery group how do you call them but whatever you call them right organized crime unit or group of people who are mostly from the balkans who would go around stealing chime and diamonds and jewels and all these whatever things from crazy places um some of them is very brazen i think they did one in dubai where they smashed a car through the entire shopping mall came into the shop and stripped it whole clean they don't they rarely use weapons 
the, the Pink Diamonds are also the same gang that ended up tying up Kim Kardashian in that Paris hotel that time and stripping her of all her jewels. So they're incredibly efficient, incredibly brutal, no, incredibly efficient, incredibly quick, incredibly effective what they do. Um, they have crazy disguises. They're all from different parts of Europe, so they're able to kind of blend in with the populace. Um, some of them are trained, you know, special forces, all that kind of crazy shit. Like, I'm a big fan of it. I love it. And I'm pretty sure I remember hearing that, I think it might have been Leonardo DiCaprio. I think Leonardo DiCaprio had bought out options for a book that's based on the Pink, the Pink Panthers that's coming out very soon. So, the reason why I say this is because I feel like some of those shows, the reason why they're so incredible, like Gomorra being a good example of it, is because they're actually written by people who are actually from there. So Gomorra is based on a book by uh, Roberto Savistano, I think that's his name, right? Um, he wrote a book about basically organized crime in Italy and especially in Sicily and the corruption that runs through the entire Italian government and police force and whatnot. And it's from first-hand accounts and it's from his kind of investigative journalism to the point where now he walks around with armed guards and he can't go anywhere. And you know I mean, his family's in danger constantly 24-7. So it's a real legit account or the closest that you can get from the horse's mouth. So when they depict it in a TV sense and they have him as a consultant still or as an EP, executive producer or whatnot, and they have other people from Italy too who are maybe from those areas or who know people from those areas writing the script the characters feel way more real everything feels more higher stakes you're way more invested in it because it actually feels like it could be a real thing and it actually has some weight behind it and it's also some fluffing and i feel like this tokyo vice what i was really happy about is when you see the end credits you see mad japanese names so i'm sure a lot of them were involved because you know there's a lot of japanese spoken in this show but i'm still i'm still hoping that a lot of those people will stay on so that it will be a show that's kind of at least close to representing what's actually going on in tokyo what's actually going on in japan overall as opposed to just a sanitized version of what the west wants to see do you know what i mean that's what i like about the show it's amazing and it's set in the 90s as well there's loads of cool little references music and things that they're listening to the phones that they use it's just really really interesting i really recommend you check it out um um, Tokyo Vice available now on HBO Max so if you're a fan of Gomorrah you would definitely like Tokyo Vice I think but yeah what do I know next on the list here we have this random thing actually I just kind of spotted quickly here on the on the old reddit of course which I'm on flipping every single day but I think I've mentioned here a few times I think on this show that I'm not the biggest uh, Kreischer fan and this this is a sad thing too because I want to like the guy because I was a big fan of his before I still think he's probably weirdly enough one of the best interviewers in comedy when it comes to actually interviewing people that he actually likes and, and he's a fan of he asks some really great questions on his podcast like really really great questions or people that he's even just curious about people maybe people he doesn't know too well people he's like intrigued by he asks some really illuminating questions but when it comes to being on a podcast I feel like this kind of adult brat or oh, sorry this adult jock no i don't joke this adult frat boy thing he's got going on um brat jock whatever you want to call it right this adult um frat boy thing he's got going on it's just a bit corny a bit cringe a bit lame and a bit annoying but i also appreciate him being a stand-up comedian and a brand of comedy that he does he kind of has to continue acting in this kind of arrested development phase right he can't really grow up because his brand is about being a silly goose fucking around taking his top off and drinking beer beers so that's whatever it may be and over time because i've been dipping in and out of the burt cars and listening it from time to time i've kind of started to like him again and i realized why i like the guy but i think before i was only listening to his podcast quite often and you know his personality can be a draining as hell and you can only take him in small doses but one of the benefits one of the good things sorry about Bert Kreiser I think is that he legitimately seems like somebody that's got a massive heart like somebody who legitimately if someone told him like you could cure world hunger by giving a charity 10 million he'd give it do you know what I mean because he just wants everyone to be happy he wants everyone to have a good time he's a kind of the kind the person that you would always want to be left alone with at the bar or the person that you would want to bump into in the toilets of a club somewhere he seems to be so so chill and for whatever reason him and tom segura one of his close friends in comedy as well who he does two bears one cave with they have this weird tradition what they have going on with their birthdays where they try and one-up each other in terms of birthday gifts and they're just trying to go above and beyond in terms of getting the perfect gift and it kind of made me smile because for someone like myself who isn't the most friendly 
I would say doesn't have the biggest friendship group and also doesn't necessarily care too much about his birthday in general at all to the point where I never ever celebrate it ever 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 and I get sometimes quite angry and people try and make me celebrate it it was quite nice to see this amount of effort and love and affection go into making someone else's day special like this is the so this is a video of Burt Kreischer basically giving Tom Segura his gift, which happens to be a souped up BMW that's been basically souped up to spec to be able to ride on a racetrack. And it's probably worth, I don't know, it, it has to be worth over 100 grand or something. It's an incredible car, right? And he's gone to all this effort to get him the car because obviously Tom Segura loves driving, you know, fast cars. It's just like, wow. It, it, from the video clip I'm going to play now, it brings Burt just as much joy to see tom happy in the car as it does tom being happy to have a car like that you know what i mean in his collection it's just insane so i'll play the clip for you now <laughs> this, this is your birthday present oh my, oh my god dude Look at this fucking thing, Tom. Um, it's like a BMW E65 or something. Exactly how we roll and then we it's God not damn. street legal. It goes so fucking fast. Yeah. It's moving. Yeah, it's a race car. I don't think it has a parking brake. I don't even know what to say. This is so insane. You want to try to sit in it? This is how tight it is? It's a fucking race car. You want to be in there snug. Oh my God. I'm going to get stuck. <laughs> amazing <laughs> I fucking just drove by a cop I was like happy birthday buddy <laughs> I love it unbelievable that was the fucking best how nice is that hey how nice is that like how happy but looks to be just giving him and again if you're not seeing the clip there's a picture of Bert here basically embracing Tom and really chuffed that he's made him happy with this gift it's a fucking fantastic present and I was just wondering in general because you see a lot of people online especially these birthday week types right from what you see for the most part it's mostly an I thing it's mostly celebrate my birthday week like give me loads of attention give me loads of gift take me out I would never under understood that if you're a birthday person would you, you want to have your closest and your dearest next to you celebrating all the week long it's kind of like similar to like a hen do or a stag do so you're going to be dragging and kicking and screaming to bars to restaurants to museums to fancy locations to shows to concerts to celebrate your day because that's what you you want to do and they're obliged to do it because it's your birthday but make it sweet i don't know maybe offer to pick them up in a car maybe offer to buy the ticket for them to go it's never like that usually with people that have birthday weeks. it's always like you turn up to a restaurant that i picked that happens to be really expensive i remember that being a shift that i remember when i was younger there was a shift when when i was younger or when i was growing yeah when i was much younger actually there was a time and period where i did celebrate our birthdays for a bit and my mom and my parents did this really sick thing where they'd give me money and say hey here's some money and you go take out your friends to nando's and this was when nando's was first sort of launching it wasn't necessarily the biggest thing ever but it was a special thing right so it wasn't like now so you know people go to nando's every single day but back then if someone to told you hey i'm gonna take you to nando's it was like oh it's like a treat so i would get some money 50 60 pound whatever it might be however much i could spend you know, you know to get everyone a meal and basically get everyone a meal just put that money behind the bar and then here or put that money behind a till whatnot and get everyone to order what they want and it was always really gratifying oddly enough even though it's my birthday and no one's getting me a gift no one got me even a flipping card right it was still nice to have everyone around the table kind of out for you and you're kind of paying for their meal do you know what I mean it was just a nice feeling it really made you feel warm inside oddly enough um because you you know nowadays or western way of kind of celebrating birthdays is more about you receiving presents but I feel sometimes like if you especially if you've got the means to do so um going out above and beyond to make someone else happy just feels way nicer it really does I don't know what, what it is about and again the bad thing about me I don't celebrate my own birthdays and I don't really give a shit about other people's birthdays either so it's not even like I'm like giving and i can kind of say yeah i can hide behind that i'm not giving and i don't receive well either which is a real pain i don't know what that is maybe it's because of a past trauma you know coming up as a kid i never really got the things i ever wanted so you kind of maybe trick your brain into believing you don't care about the birthdays so that you don't get hurt if you don't get the thing that you want maybe i don't know or maybe it's just genuinely there are people like me who exist who just don't give a flying f about birthdays i've never have if anything 
the closest thing that I really did with that was trying to be special was one one time I tried to throw a party for my myself in Dawson ages ago and you know seven people turned up which was super embarrassing but it was just you know it was a party I tried to promote no one really cared and it was what it is but that was the last time I tried to put on an event for myself maybe that was the reason I don't know I don't know what that is I don't know let me know in the comments if you're the same do you really celebrate your birthday I don't know maybe because it's a thing you have to do under the age of 21 or something but I want to know if you're over the age of 25 let's say do you celebrate your birthday do you go out and do you go above and beyond is it something that you just wait for people to give you gifts for do you give people do you give people the opportunity to make no do you give your friends and your family an easy opt-in to attend your birthdays like do you pay for ubers do you promise to pay for ubers going or going back home do you supplement some of the meal do you put some money behind a bar to get drinks like let me know i want to know what people are doing out there because i don't know if i'm the freak or if it's just normal what i do in terms of never celebrating birthdays and at the most i might go to shop and buy myself a little tonic wine and cheers myself do you know what i mean like hey here's for another year you survived it's a bit grim it's a bit sad but you know that's what i usually do when it comes to celebrating my birthdays but you know maybe i'm in the minority there but who knows moving on we have this clip courtesy of DJ Academics, actually, let me pause this because it's fucking 6 9 screaming. Um, very interesting clip that I'm going to play here. So, this is DJ, this is um, a clip from DJ Academics' podcast called Off the Record. Yeah, Off the Record on Spotify. And he had a sit down with 6 9 Hassan Campbell, and Wack 100. And you already know with those lists of names, it's going to be an absolute crazy situation. One thing that I can't really get my head around when it comes to 6 ix 9 I think I'm going to play the clip so you can see and you can kind of maybe get your glean your own opinion from this. But if I'm not mistaken, to give some context on the clip, Hassan Kambo in one of his videos said something along the lines of, oh, because um, uh, I think, yes, yeah, 6 9 got kidnapped before he ratted and everything. He got kidnapped by his own crew when I think his own crew felt like he wasn't maybe giving money or he was or he was suspect, I don't know. Something happened that led to 6 9 being kidnapped by his own gang. Hassan Campbell said in his podcast, hey, that would never be me, that could never be me, I would never get caught lacking like that, right? Um, but then um, 6 9 basically puts it, twists it the other way and says, okay, it's okay to say that to me, but then if, if I got caught lacking, what do you call what happened to Nipsey? What do you call what happened to Pop Smoke? And what do you call what happened to King Vaughn? Basically, that's what he's saying in that in that regard. And he's kind of screaming and shouting about it. And they're having this back and forth. But I'll play the clip so you can hear what 6 9 saying. Um, you know, he's not the he's not he's not the best conversationist in the world because he just screams and gets irate, but I can kind of see where he's coming from. And also I think it's complete gobbledygook. That, that's what the I point said. I proved. This is the point I proved. Sir, right? He said if he was in that position, I think I'm like half new. I said, yo, it happened to the best of us. I said, what if you was in that position? And he said, if you was lacking. He said, I'm never lacking. I said, all right, cool. He going to bring it the gangster route. So what you going to do when you lacking? So Nipsey, was Nipsey a stand tall nigga? I believe, I don't know him. So I can't say. All right, so what, what? The best get killed. So I can't take nothing away from him because he got murdered. So the best well, shit happened well, in niggas listen, too. Yes, it does. Listen, listen, look, look, nigga? This is what I want. Was Pop listen. Smoke real? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Was Pop Smoke a stand up tall nigga? Was he... A, a he, was a, he was a baby. I don't know. He was a baby. Okay, I, I'm asking you, was Pop Smoke a stand tall nigga? I can't I say know. that. Was Pop Smoke? I know, I but I'm answering he is. now. I believe he is. I don't Nobody know. Nobody answering now? He was a rapper. I didn't know. All right, All right, cool, 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 cool. Was King Vaughn a stand up tall nigga? King Vaughn was a get busy nigga. All right, so why was he, he was lacking? So, why huh? was he lacking? You know what? Why was he lacking? It doesn't matter. You missing, I, I don't understand So what is point. King Vaughn right now? He's dead. But what's the point though? I'm right then. So, so, so King Bond is a solid nigga, and he got killed, right? The nigga, the nigga poked out and put five in him, right? And he died, right? So King Bond died, lacking. You hurt my feelings. No, 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 no. Hear what I'm saying? Right, may he rest in King peace, man. King Bond died lacking. Nipsey died lacking. Pop Smoke died lacking. Right. So niggas can't lack? No, you can't. All right. Kill or be killed in these streets. All right. So there's nothing to talk about. So when you say yo, shit happened to you, shit happened to niggas. Don't pick it up too. Why you yeah, listen? Why you think I say? Okay, so you, you get just a way he's trying to say here, and then the caption says the following: He says, "My point is for people who don't understand." Quote unquote, I was lacking when shit happened to me. It happens to the best of us, to the best. So why single me out? 
when your favorite rapper gets caught lacking and doesn't survive the situation they never spoken down on i guess it's just that it's cool to hate on six nine now which is cool i don't care but understand my point is not a math problem it's a simple common sense so the the kind of the kind of basis or the conclusion of this whole thing i don't understand is that for whatever reason it feels like six nines on this quest to tell people that even though he snitched even though he might be a federal informant even though he put half or most of his gang um in prison based on the words that he said by testifying in court and kind of went against the oath of being a gangster and being a somewhat of a criminal he thinks that he can somehow still come out and maintain the same energy and still be dangerous right still be somebody that people can are wary of coming around or getting next to or stepping to or having a problem with because he has it on him or because he's dangerous or because he's willing to kind of die on his on his word whatever it may be right but the issue here with this is not even that because i you know there's plenty of actual legit gangsters who have killed people who have been involved with some very very you know heinous things to people right out there in the world who have come out and snitched or who come out who did snitch when they're in prison and maybe come out earlier with the time wherever it may be but the but there's nothing there's no one out there that's kind of doubting their gangster no one out there's thinking they're not tough it's just they went against the code and when you go against the code it it bet it basically invalidates everything you've done you know you'd imagine being a criminal or being somebody that kind of operates in the underworld part of the reason why you do that is because you kind of want to be off grid and the only way to kind of maintain some sort of law or some sort of order is to have some kind of moral code or something that you kind of stand behind right and you'd imagine that would be the kind of muerta, right the idea that you don't talk to police ever um you stick by your brothers um you know come rain or shine like you got into this life of crime knowing the bet knowing the kind of pros and the cons right the pros were you're going to be able to make money fast you're going to get you know rep you were going to be able to do some amazing things fly around the world bloody blah 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 but the cons were that you legitimately might go to prison or you might get killed or somebody in your crew might betray you but those were the cons where you knew what the positive and negatives were going into it so it's very difficult to come now be somebody like a 6 9 who was never a gangster to begin with that's the thing we have to keep clear he was just a rapper guy right trying to make it and of course you know aligning himself with treyway was a way to basically legitimize his gangster legitimize his street cred and it basically allowed him to have the career that he's still eating off now so to sit there and somehow try to justify your snitching or to justify the fact that you got caught lacking because some of the best of the best got caught lacking doesn't mean jack shit because no one's comparing him to pop smoke no one's comparing him to king vaughn no one's even comparing him to nipsey because we all know he's not that guy because we know more likely than not if those guys are still alive and they'll put in the same situation that six nine was knowing full well that he put hits out on people and he still put those guys in prison even for a little while they would never tell or you would imagine you would hope they wouldn't tell and i don't really see why that's so hard to see like I, I i don't get this but 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 i guess that goes to show i guess that goes for most of the world right most of the world out there you see even thing going on with like this is a weird correlation to make but you see it even with the body positivity movement there's body positivity which is cool fine except you can accept the skin you're in you can be whatever weight and size you want and still be beautiful of course we all agree with that but then to sit there and say your you know being big and beautiful is just as beautiful as you know giselle bunch and you know modeling something for victoria's secret that just doesn't make any sense you can't have everything yeah you know i mean you can have some things i think that's progress being made where people are not vomiting at the sight of a fat person on the billboard but to say that that person on the billboard is the same as runway models is not the is not the truth because we know what looks better especially in fashion type clothes on what type of frame or we know what conventionally looks better based on years and years and hundreds of millions of years of, of evolution that's the thing i kind of see with what he's going on good doing like he's trying to say just because i snitched doesn't mean i'm not puss doesn't mean i'm not doesn't mean i'm pussy i can still be about my biz but it's like no you can't because you were a civilian before you got involved with treyway treyway they made you a somewhat of a criminal made you blood which then allowed you to have this street cred which then allowed you to have this career and and clearly as well off the back of it they also gave you amazing tunes because since he's separated treyway his music has never been this that's not the other thing too i want people to i would love to get his insight on or someone to ask him an interview what's with the lack of quality in music why have you gone from making decent tracks that were annoying 
to now making unlistable tracks like unlistable i still remember when he dropped his first album i was banging in the gym for like a week straight it was really great gym material because i think it might have been like under 50 minutes there was like nine ten tracks or something of just two minute fucking bangers that just slapped you across the head and of course at that time you thought he was about what he was about so he kind of gave you an extra sort of pep in your steps so or listening to like being the seagull back in the day rapping his flipping you know um rob robbery and stick em up flipping um bars it just get it just got you going so i would like to for people to ask him that hey six nine why is it that your music now sounds trash compared to what you were doing beforehand you know the street cred is gone we understand that you're not with the gang anymore we understand that but why is the music so bad were the, were the gang also supplying music they were not only supplying you with street cred they were not only supplying you with protection they were not only supplying you with connections and making sure you're good wherever you went they were also supplying you with it looks like writing ability and talent because so far his music has been trash compared to anything else he's put out before and it just is what it is but again interesting interview i guess it's going to be dropping soon or maybe it's out already i'm not too sure um ah, the other other thing is all well, that's flipping interesting in the interview um hassan Campbell mentioned in passing that flipping alpo martinez the legendary gangster who was um partly based on the what's it what's that movie called Ah, uh, i forgot it escapes my head but you know alpo martinez is who he died who died recently who came out of jail who double one a snitch came out of jail and was basically taunting everybody by parading himself around harlem driving flipping harley davidson's and shit he allegedly um had caught two bodies when he came back home so he got involved in some pattern with somebody and he still managed to catch two bodies without getting caught that's some serious killer shit allegedly that's the case which is mad to reveal on a podcast at that offhand he was like yeah but he's dead in it is what it is but it's like jesus christ man who are these two bodies that he dropped does anybody know this else know this was just something only known on the streets like wild wild stuff man that's what that's the danger i feel like with these podcasts in general when you get guys around the table um kind of weirdly enough you know measuring each other's dicks right it always ends up like this people has and people always end up spilling news that they probably shouldn't spill just because they want to look like they're down and you know eventually it comes down to bite them all in the ass and obviously that's what happened here so um check it out when it does come out i guess um six nine whack 100 has uncomfortable dj academics it should be an interesting one just to see where his kind of mindset or mind state is at, at the moment but we all know this isn't going to end well overall because he clearly has a death wish he clearly doesn't want to be around anymore and if anything he probably would be happy dying as a somewhat of a snitch martyr or something you know what i mean because he, he i don't know you would imagine coming out of prison off the back of the charges that he was on facing the time that he was facing you just want to come and come out and sort of maybe turn your life around and be a sort of example to others that hey maybe living that life of crime isn't the best way to go about things but if anything he's been doubling down on something that he never stood for clearly he can't stand for anymore because he snitched but he's still trying to convince the world that he's not he's still that guy it's like you can't have everything my friend you can't you have to pick and you know you, you make the choices you make in life as a guy you have to just stand behind it it just is what it is but you know maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm wrong so in other news too i think i mentioned it beforehand about um elon musk basically putting in a bid to buy twitter right he wants to reclaim that platform and legitimately turn it into a platform for free speech because in his head and in many people's heads who i kind of follow within that kind of intellectual dark web space they basically view twitter as the de facto public square so if it is a de facto public square everyone should have the ability to say what the hell they want and if you don't like it you can turn around of course if it breaks you know terms and conditions you can get booted up but for the most part everyone should be everyone should have the ability to say whatever they want on twitter to a certain degree um because that's the only space and platform everyone has to basically share their opinions and views where people most people pay attention to so i like that and also myself being a free speech absolutist in terms of people can say what they want i would like that as well to see that be much more a platform i think it make it a far more exciting platform to use as a user anyway even if you don't agree with what people say to let people just have the ability to fly off the handle and say what they want truly without um the threat of having their entire livelihoods taken away from them is one because no let, let's take it away the livelihood thing the livelihood thing i i get if it's a private company whatever it may be called if if you say something wild on twitter and they want to sack you cool but i've never got the double whammy the sort of double jeopardy the sort of like double punishment sort of similar to football right i think they got rid of that law where 
um, if you're the last man, you get sent off and a, and a team gets a penalty. It's like, come on. You know, the team's already getting a penalty. That's already bad enough. Sending off the goalkeeper as well is just double punishment for nothing. So maybe in this case, okay, let the companies or the people around you, the sponsors and the brand say, hey, we don't want to associate with you anymore because you said the Jan 6 riots were flipping just and, and correct. Or you think Trump, you know, should have won the election and it got rigged. Whatever those crazy things you say, say them. But that doesn't mean then you can get a flipping, um, it doesn't mean you can get a, um, what's it called? You can get flipping sponsorship with, I don't know, Adidas or something, right? Because they don't want to align with you. That makes complete sense. But unfortunately, nowadays, especially when it comes to social media, especially when it comes to saying things that are maybe not um, the most widely accepted points of view, people immediately then want to completely remove from every single platform whether it's you know every social media platform any place where you can maybe make some revenue elsewhere you get completely blocked and in some cases they even stop your ability to bank in certain places right in order to leave donations and tips and whatnot subscriptions just it's a bit it's a bit crazy so i think at this point there does need to be at least one platform it doesn't need to be everything not everything needs to probably follow twitter's kind of lead or maybe what elon musk wants to do with twitter but there should be at least one platform that exists out there where you can just fly off the seat of your pants and say what the hell you want and why not it be twitter because twitter you can write things you can maybe share voice notes you can get into twitter spaces it feels more like a discussionary sort of platform anyway so that should be the place where you should be able to say what you want and of course elon's had a very you know um, tumultuous relationship with twitter and with people on there and with the things that he said in the past um some of them you know <laughs> have been a bit nuts especially when he went after that flipping um that guy that was trying to save the kids in the cave and whatnot and called him a pedo he's had a very very interesting past in that regard but i also think you know in my hopeful brain that he legitimately thinks that he can do something like he can fix this and i kind of believe him because why not the kind of way it's going now at the moment doesn't necessarily seem like the best option to go forward. It's not necessarily getting any better, even though I still think it's the best social media platform out there. I think it's the best social media platform despite what Twitter do, not in spite of what they do. Like they don't really add to it. I don't feel like I feel like the people on there are what kind of make that platform pop in the way it does. But if the Elon's able to kind of get in the right people, sort out some of the spam, sort out some of the bots, you know, whatever else needs to be done. I think it will be a pretty good thing, but obviously Twitter don't wanna don't want to sell to him because essentially what Twitter's also turned into, if it's also the de facto um public square, it's also turned into a political societal tool for the elites for the most part, right? It's become the mouthpiece for mainstream media. It's become a place where certain companies and brands can basically exert power and influence and basically get some accounts taken down they can stop discussion on certain topics like it's become a little bit crazy so it does make sense why there is some pushback um on twitter in terms of getting elon to be the guy to do it because you know with elections coming up and whatnot they can't have you know it be a free speech um you know free for all because that's not what they want because you know if anything especially in the states with what's been going on with the hunter biden laptop and whatnot and with the lab leak theory in terms of covid there's clearly some sort of um external pressure or force that's basically making sure people don't speak about certain topics in public or they don't speak about it in a certain way so if you then get elon musk in who's saying hey i'm the free speech champion to do it it's not going to be good for them. So I understand why they're pushing back, but the idealist in me, the optimist in me, the person that kind of wants to see at least one platform out there that you can do and say what you want to within reason, it will be cool to see it, but you know, it's not looking like it's going to happen. But this update is courtesy of the BBC. It says Twitter board has armed itself against a possible hostile takeover a day after Elon Musk made a $43 billion, $33 billion pound offer to buy the platform. It has adopted what is known as a limited duration shareholder rights plan, also known as a poison pill. Crazy anything to say. Um, the move will prevent anyone having more than 15% stake in the company. It does this by allowing others to buy additional shares at a discount. The Twitter board detailed this defense plan to US Secretary, so US Securities and Exchange Commission, and put out a statement saying that it needed it needed it, it was needed because of Musk's unsolicited non-binding proposal to acquire Twitter. So essentially they are willing to burn the company down to a certain extent in order to get 
Elon away from them in terms of buying it. Crazy, isn't it? A takeover bid is considered hostile when one company tries to acquire another company wishes uh, against the wishes of the company's management in Twitter's case, the executive board. Josh White, former financial economist of the Securities Exchange Commission, told the BBC that the poison pill is one of those last lines of defense against a hostile takeover bid. We call it the nuclear weapon. Mr. White says that the board has made it clear that they don't feel that it's a right high value that they don't feel like it's a high value. It's enough. So they don't feel like it's a high enough value for the company. That's crazy. It doesn't make any sense because if I'm pretty sure Musk's valuation was like $50 a share. And I think they were trading at $30 a share before he put his bid in. So they're obviously going to earn a fat check off the back of it. Um, but clearly the board don't want to let their shareholders win that way. So I wonder if they can bypass it for the show. I don't know. And it says the followers, Mr. Musk um, has signaled that he is not willing to negotiate a higher price. The Twitter board went ahead with the poison bill. Mr. White says that he was surprised Mr. Musk's negotiation tactic because if the end game is to acquire the company, it might not be the right approach. He says, I actually think if he was truly serious about a takeover attempt, he would have started at a price and left the window open for negotiation. The plan will expire on April the 14th of next year. Chief Executive Parag Agwal previously said the company has not been... Uh, held hostage by the offer. Meanwhile, Mr. Musk said at the TED 2020 conference in Vancouver, I'm not sure that I will actually be able to acquire it, he said. Um, but he added that he does have a plan B though, if he doesn't, but he did not divulge it. Mr. Musk announced a night, but, 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 but yeah, you understand why the C chief executive officer of flipping Twitter doesn't want that deal to go through because he knows as soon as that deal goes through, he's out of a job, right? He's getting fired immediately. If Musk is going to bring his own people um, to probably take uh, you know position in some of the maybe key positions in twitter anyway especially some of the shot caller ones and a lot of those people have had legacy really important jobs for a while and the last thing those guys want is to have those jobs taken away from them the ability to have their you know ha their kind of haloed um, blue check marks given away as well that's not something that they want so i understand the pushback but the idealist in me would love to see it, man. Would love to see it happen because I think it would be the necessary shakeup needed to maybe rebalance the scales, I think, of social media. Because at the moment, the ugh, the flipping oversight some of these companies have in terms of removing you from having a voice, it's just too much, I think, in general. You can build an entire career on Twitter in terms of your hot takes and what you say and then one day you fall afoul of the algorithm or you say the wrong thing, you say the wrong phrase and suddenly your whole livelihood gets taken away from your ability to put food on the table to, you know, a shelter over your head, clothes on your back is taken away. I just don't think that's really fair in general, especially if your fans back you. But like I said, that's why I'm not a fan of counterculture in that way because counterculture nowadays isn't, you know, highlighting people doing wrong and then letting the public decide. Counterculture is like, no, we've decided what you did is wrong. We're the judge and the jury. You've got no, you've got no career. I feel like, however heinous you are, like for instance, if R. Kelly comes out and is able to put on, you know, maybe R. Kelly is not a good example because he did with kids and stuff, but maybe that's is a good example. If R. Kelly comes out and he wants to do an arena tour. I don't think every stadium in the world should ban him from doing arena tours. If he wants to book the arena tour and people are willing to see him play, let them see him play. There's other sickos out here who are able to garner audiences and do what the hell they want, namely being the flipping Catholic church, right? How many kids have they did all over the flipping many centuries of the world, but they still are able to have these tax exempt flipping cathedrals all over the place. It doesn't make any sense. I just feel like at the end of the day, we should always be the people that, basically are the ones that do have the final say in things and usually when it comes to bad people the public are the ones that decide if you're a heinous person and people don't like you the, and society turns their back on you usually there's no coming back from it no matter what the media tries to do in terms of paying you to be a good person or to be a bad person if society thinks you're done you're done so i don't know why we don't do that with cancel culture but you know maybe i'm not the right person to speak about this stuff who the hell knows who the hell knows Next, we want to talk about quickly, of course, the new Drake and Jack Harlow track, which now has been tentatively called Have Your Have a Turn. Um, number one, I don't know how this came out. It's a leak that sounds legitimately perfect. Like it sounds like album quality leak. I'm not sure if it's a leak from Jack Harlow's forthcoming album, if it's a throwaway that Drake usually does where he throws up on SoundCloud. I don't know. 
but regardless it is an absolute banger from the beat selection from how hard jack hollow comes in and his verse from how hard flipping rex spins on his one it's a legitimately good verse and i think for most people listen to this obviously people took away from this that drake was coming at um push T, which is interesting because from what we understand reading between the lines of what Pusha T said in various interviews because he's promoting his new album that's coming out he has essentially moved on from the Drake beef um I think he said in the interview with maybe Duda Samiro or maybe Duda Samiro maybe Charlemagne or something I don't know who he said the interview with basically having his kid um was his way of kind of maybe understanding Drake's position in the situation like knowing that okay maybe what I did in terms of revealing his son to the world before he got a chance to reveal it was something that i would never accept in terms of bringing a kid into a rap beef because i'm willing to go wherever do you know what i mean i'm willing to go as far as it needs to be in order to exact revenge so maybe he now sees how it could look that because i think at the time when they were going back and forth that was one of pusha t's like points that he was standing on 10 toes like nah when it's rap beef when it's beef in general there are no rules like rules go out the window you want to hurt the person as much as you can so you want to say the most foul shit possible so if i can find a soft spot or sensitive point for you i'm gonna find it i'm gonna exploit it and he obviously did to his advantage with the flipping um let's get this off the screen with the um with obviously the revelation of flipping um drake's kid that he hadn't revealed to the world or maybe he would never reveal to the world who absolutely knows but god damn drake came for pusha t's neck hard um where was it uh it's over here in it right uh, yeah there we go um he says it here so uh where does it go here uh it's a daytona line wasn't it forever again bigger growing pain so not probably oh yes yeah, so, yeah so the middle is it i think it's the middle man yeah yeah that's the one um so good man um yeah so first of all you would say the opening verse that like, lucky me people don't fuck with me are linking up with people that don't fuck with me to fuck with me this shit is getting ugly and every time every situation is transactional everything is saying is irrational every way they're moving is promotional everybody's acting irreplaceable it's like they ain't disposable my ages to revenge are uncontrollable i know they're getting older though yeah but i gotta get that nigga back for that of course i, I say that's push a t um it's non-negotiable it's not even debatable i'm getting so rich my music ain't even relatable which I could definitely agree with being a long-term um, Drake fan. I blow a head. It's an inflatable baby blue G class. I feel like a kid again, praying on my downfall. Don't make you religious, man. I honestly, honestly think there's a lot of pusher, some sort of Kanye disses included in there as well, that religious line. And then of course it comes down to here. Um, I think this is a bit right. Um, if I see you, I spit in your faces. I too. Bay Daytonas with the green faces, Dakota Derby races. My precise, no, my presence in the spot is so abrasive. So obviously, you would imagine if I see you, I spit in your faces like the, the like it's on. So you would imagine Drake maybe heard that interview that Pusha T done, and he basically was like, "Nah, this is this is up and it's stuck forever." Like you came at me, you came at my family. You try to sun me in public it's never forgiving i'm never forgiving you this is always up and stuck when i see you it's on it's on site for real and um to be honest and also the line here talk about pusha t also because i think pusha t mentioned the charlemagne um, interview there was a guy that pusha t allegedly kind of came up with who basically was also involved in the gang that pusha t was in and he then came on vlad and basically tried to expose pusha and say he wasn't really a gangster and he was just like a side man middle man kind of thing so this is obviously drake sort of like sticking a knife in there right by saying all i hear is plug talk coming from middlemen all i hear is tall tales coming from little men um which is obviously a bit of a son but i feel like personally when drake's backs against the wall when people think he's pussy when people think he hasn't really got it anymore in terms of bars those are usually the times he cops up with a little throwaway and just reminds you how strong he's penning his pen is and how good his delivery is in general because that's the thing is what you have to always i think take away from this because that's why maybe a lot of people are getting really hyped on jack harlow because jack harlow right now is in that kind of coming up stage he's still not saying anything worthwhile i don't think and not anything memorable don't get me wrong maybe this verse was probably his best so far in terms of coming with a hellfire but 
his delivery makes you think of Drake because of how effortlessly and how fun and funny and sort of um how he kind of gets your attention despite not saying much at all but what drake did earlier on early early on was obviously his ability to kind of somewhat make it um melodic but also his ability to hold your attention and say something in his raps as well which made people think oh shit he might be one of the best rappers ever until obviously all that quinted miller stuff happened with the whole like writing whatnot but maybe that's why people see jack harlow as being that guy because he's he's of that kind of ilk in terms of his delivery is so impressive in terms of his voice his tonality his breath control his enunci enunciation whatever that term is right people how you how you pronounce your words like it's just perfect and they suit each other really well now i'm pretty sure this is probably going to end up being a single on jack harlow's album that's going to be coming out soon but i could also see it maybe being a single off of a maybe a mixtape that they put up just for the fun of it of them going back and forth off of random tracks and shit that would be pretty sick if they're able to do so um but yeah an absolute banger of a track i'm eagerly anticipating Pusha T's response to drake what will he say will he say anything is he actually a change man now he has a child or is or another thing that we haven't considered maybe Pusha T's album that's due to come out drake's already heard it and there may be a track on there where Pusha's coming after Drake. So Drake did the same thing that Pusha did to him and sort of preempted it by kind of coming out with a single beforehand just to kind of set the scene. Yeah. And so people would have said, oh, this is out of the blue. You're bullying him, blah, 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 blah. I don't know. But it's an incredible track. If you can find it, it's out there. I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube and whatnot. It didn't come out officially anyway, so I'm not really sure if they're going to be able to register it and monetize it and take it down. But I didn't want to play it just in case. But honestly... Um, it's called Have a Turn. It's a bit of a shit name for the single. I'm not sure if that's the official name, but it's an absolutely banging track. Jack Collar and Drake. Really, really check it out. I'm actually going to play it as my tune of the week. So definitely check it out at the end of the podcast. Listen to the audio version. You're able to hear what that ends up sounding like. Moving on. Courtesy of TMZ, we've got this really heartbreaking news. A reminder that the great Mac Miller has left us um, a, long, a, a while ago now, it feels like. But one of the drug dealers that were involved with selling him the pills that eventually ended up killing him has been sentenced to 11 years in prison. Um, for me, as a fan of his music, it's probably not enough because, you know, the guy's never going to come back. But it's good to see some level of retribution and punishment has come the way of the people who were partly responsible for his untimely death. So courtesy of TMZ, it says one of the drug dealers who supplied fentanyl lace pills to Mac Miller just received this sentence after copying a plea last year and he's going to prison for a long time. Um, Ryan Rivas will be behind bars for 11, 10 to 11 years after pleading guilty in November to one count distributing fentanyl. The sentence is longer than what Rivas himself had asked for, five years, but shorter than 12.5 years the prosecutors were gunning for. Remember, the Fed says Rivas supplied the deadly oxycodone pills to Max alleged drug dealer Cameron Pettit on orders of Stephen um, Walter, who was recently pleaded guilty for distributing fentanyl. Reva said in court on Monday that he was just a middleman. The alleged pills, obviously, you see there. Uh, more importantly, he claimed that he had no idea the pills were supplying were counterfeit. Despite this, a judge seemed to have a dish doubt an even handed sentence, but not before hearing a statement from MM's mother, um, Karen Myers. Um, in it, it read in part, he would never knowingly take a pill with fentanyl ever. He wanted to live and he was excited about the future. The hole in our heart will always be there. In other words, she insisted the alleged dealers of the case were solid from the first death. As reported, Rivas was first arrested back in 2019 out of Arizona with officers. So where authorities say they found a bogus doctor's notepad, which he presumably filled prescriptions. They also claimed they found firearms and drugs, including prescription only pills and marijuana. So just to keep it track, Rivas, the alleged supplier, is the first out of the three men charged to receive the sentence. Walter, the original runner, who is officially hasn't learned his fate yet neither has petty the original dealer whose case is still pending so everyone in the chain that they can get a hold of is going to get punished for this and i think in terms of fentanyl based crimes or especially in drugs where people are taking fentanyl laced coke fentanyl laced pills um weed whatever it may be the punishment does need to be far more harsher especially nowadays that people know the risk involved with giving people drugs that contain fentanyl it's basically lethal there are no cases usually 
we've seen so far were people who have basically been saved from overdosing on fentanyl there is the odd one here and there i remember there was a case of some police officer in america who did a stop on a car and he somehow got the fentanyl that was in there on his fingertips or maybe he inhaled it by accident and he ended up having a flipping seizure on the floor and nearly od and his cop friend had to save him and shit crazy right? only because he was there if he wasn't there he would have died so clearly everyone knows the risk involved with fentanyl the dealers of course on their end especially if you're a drug dealer you don't expect them to be ethical at least in the slightest i know there was that article ages ago on vice about there being a um, ethical cocaine scene which is flipping ridiculous but it does exist where people are legitimately trying to source their cocaine without um without it basically having any blood on it or whatnot which is crazy but it does you know people are out there thinking they're buying ethical cocaine but it's just regular coke that's been marketed as being ethical which is you know crazy and funny at the same time but the fentanyl thing from the drug um manufacturer's point of view it makes sense on their end because of how cheap and sort of um easily attainable fentanyl is and in terms of what it can do in terms of turning your somewhat mundane product into something very potent with the right dosage but again much like ghb fentanyl dosage is you know lethal because if you take too much it legitimately can kill you like ghb can and i just feel like nowadays with people who have been stuck at home for the best part of two and a half years finally going out wanting to let their hair down have a bit of fun to have those fentanyl laced drugs out there on the street for people who maybe aren't as experienced or maybe don't have as much heart prep under there who maybe haven't not used to taking as many drugs as they did beforehand because they've had like a two-year break or because they weren't able to go to clubs or go outside i just think it's very very unfair I think it's ridiculously unfair and it's somewhat evil to be selling that stuff on the street it really is um it just feels like you're you're kind of doing it on purpose now because we all know the risk is involved like i said it's lethal there are no there are no comebacks from taking fentanyl laced drugs and you just would hope that maybe going forward in the future that these punishments can be far more harsh so that there are no incentives um, or the incentives are basically taken away in terms of getting people to um, do such a thing because if you're locking up you know the pushers and the dealers on the street for 10 plus years the manufacturers on their end won't want to work with somebody who's only going to buy once you want somebody you can have a long term relationship with who's going to be able to buy brick after brick after brick so you know you might want to lay off the fentanyl at the source and then maybe just do it that way i know there's still people on the street who are pushing fentanyl in this sort of stuff but a lot of it is coming from the source which is obviously kind of crazy but again r.i.p mac miller man absolute legend really sad that he's gone and not around anymore i feel like now more than ever his voice is more so needed especially regarding the kind of music we have now at the moment and the body of work he would have created going forward man it's just really really sad but hey what can you do next let's move on to this topic courtesy of page six it is a quick one regarding pregnant rihanna and asap rocky and join a date in barbados after breakup rumors so if you were under a rock you would have known or unless you were living on the rock you would have known that for whatever reason out of the blue on social media are uh, two accounts one being some middle eastern guy i think who lives in dubai basically came out first and said oh um rumors on the street are that rihanna and asap rocky are broken up and then he deleted the original tweet people started going wild on the internet and then that was it and then out of the blue another account um this guy called luis pisano who i think goes by the name luis via the roma i think how you say his name on twitter how do you say it uh luis via roma who's called uh, luis pisano pisano on instagram who's basically a cultural commentator fashion commentator somebody who kind of you see a lot of shows stunting and doing his thing um, he decided to come out with a bit more clarity in terms of what actually went on and basically said yeah they've broken up asap rocky has been dating or cheating on rihanna with a fenty shoe designer um this other lady called amina something it's been going on for a while they broke up in paris and basically added some detail to the whole story and the whole social media flipping erupted because you know rihanna's kind of been the the somewhat the healing saving grace in terms of social media attention with her you know pregnancy announcement and just kind of her you know crazy looks that she's been doing in terms of kind of redefining what pregnancy outfits look like on the gram or on social media in general and obviously you know them being a bit of a cute couple in the first place i think people were basically taken aback that rocky would <coughs> um, cheat on rihanna given the situation that they're in 
or given the circumstances of her being pregnant and them just welcoming their first child craziness but then for me personally it didn't feel like it felt weird to see that rumor because it felt unnecessary even if it was true especially coming from you would say someone you would deem to be like a black voice a black creative because it feels like for the most part you do hear a lot of people in media who operate blogs or who operate instagram accounts or who have their own platforms where they basically stream cultural news regarding hip-hop and black entertainment and whatnot and fashion a lot of those people get really annoyed when they see these you know some of the bigger names within black culture go and do interviews with the hollywood reporter variety vogue id magazine dazed and confused hype it's whatever these platforms are and they say like oh why don't they ever come and talk to us and this is partly you would imagine the reason why because the black platforms are messy as hell like they kind of thrive in operating in the muck like putting their nose in the trough and just being messy as hell and spreading the most unsolicited rumors um and slander and not really having any pride in their work in you know or maybe in the ability to maybe you know keep um what's everything called in harvesting relationships and keeping people sweet it is ridiculous like you think of even jason lee earlier on in the flipping pandemic didn't he spread the rumor that allegedly the queen had died and she wasn't dead why did he think anyone would believe the first place you would hear the breaking story that the queen would dead would be the hollywood that locked it didn't make any sense and i feel like this whole story is basically a reminder as to why some of the biggest names in black culture don't go and speak to blogs first about whatever they're going through or just sit down in terms of having a sit down interview because they know because these black blogs are you know from the culture they pay way more attention to the messy stuff than the mainstream public does so when you sit down with the shade room or with the it's on site you know you're going to get messy questions because they detail every single part of your life sometimes to annoying detail which is why they go and speak to variety deadline hollywood reporter interview magazine id and all these kind of places because then they're going to get softball questions out and you're going to make them look good not things that are going to harm their brand and obviously um you know via this picture we can know now that the rumors that they were breaking up is not true even if it was true maybe it is partially true because i think there was a picture someone shared of them at dinner where it looks like rihanna's crying but you can't really see if she's crying because it's a picture taken from really really far away on a super zoom but maybe they had a some sort of falling out some sort of argument you know in the run-up of them giving birth to their first child i'm sure it happens quite often and not where you basically break up seven times you know on the way to giving birth but so what like unless they come out and say it officially why does that even need to be spread why is that news that needs to be put out there especially considering that she's a woman who's giving birth to her first child you'd imagine especially if she's so beloved that people say this they if people loved her the way they, they actually say they do love her you'd imagine their actions would actually match up to it where they wouldn't be quick to go out there and put false rumors out in order to kind of make her stressed and whatever it may be you wouldn't want to do that you'd want to basically you know hold your girl down if riri was your girl from afar as people call her online riri and you wouldn't want to put out some salacious story but you know people do what they do i guess anyway the courtesy of the story in, on the new york post sorry page six sorry it says they still have love on a brain when the of rocky appear to be going strong during their barbados sorry barbadian vacation despite a recent cheating scandal that turned out to be hogwash the we found love singer 34 and fucking problems rapper 33 i didn't know they were that close in age i thought they were further okay were spotted walking side by side after going out for dinner together rihanna was dressed in her signature maternity style in a sexy strappy black dress meanwhile rocky appeared cool and casual in a pair of jeans a t-shirt and a trucker hat and sneakers the couple flew to savage and fenty designers native home over the weekend and rumors that rocky had been unfaithful writer louis bizano whom interview magazine called instagram's messiest fashion influencer imagine wanting to have that be your brand being messy could never be me to the speculation on twitter writing rihanna and asap rocky have split rihanna broke up with him after she caught him cheating with a shoe designer amina Maud maudidi but let's let's counteract that let's go back a bit maybe the brand of being messy isn't too bad if you think about it because i'd imagine a lot of the stuff this guy says is probably stuff people talk about behind closed doors a lot of people talk about behind closed doors maybe through whatsapp groups maybe through emails 
a lot of the gossip that goes around we basically i would imagine the the public gets the real gossip that's going on behind the scenes way later or way after the fact this actually actually happened people in the scene way know way more but they don't want it to get in the public because they don't want it to affect their brand they don't want it to affect their bags it makes complete sense but you would imagine doing that and putting that stuff out in the public would probably make you enemy number one to the people that you operate in the industry because they wouldn't be comfortable being around you because they feel like you're a bit of a chatty pay like if you hear some stuff you know around a dinner table at some swanky event you might go and tweet about it and they don't want that because people can easily put two and two together and figure out who it came from if they do enough investigating work on social media you know how people are in it jobless people bored people just people that have a passion for finding out who said what they were able to put it together and they don't want to jeopardize their position either so but i just i just don't i just don't think as a black creative you should be doing that. i just think there should be far better avenues that you should be using your platform there should be far better ways to use your platform than to be out there trying to bring down people within your own community you would say right um people who kind of had this had the same struggle as you had in terms of coming up and making something of themselves just doesn't make any sense personally for me but you know everyone's different in the way that they go about their things but again rihanna's maternity style is undefeated in it imagine wearing she i don't think she's worn flats do you think that she's worn i think that's remember seeing flats was those union jordan fours the guava ones that may be the only flattest shoe she's worn her entire pregnancy it's always been high heels and short skirts like crazy man absolute legendary but anyway continue um after the rumor picked up steam maudidi um, was forced to address the the allegations the fashion designer faith for real on instagram and said i always believe that an unfounded lie spread on social media doesn't deserve any response or clarification especially one that is so vile however in the last four 24 hours i've been reminded that we live in a society that is so quick to speak on topics regardless of the factual basis and that nothing is off limits she added relative to rihanna's pregnancy not even during what would be the most beautiful and celebrated times of one's life she didn't outright deny it in the statement but again if the statement if the rumor is based on no factual truth you don't even need to address it just kind of move on and keep it going but i guess considering the two people involved it's considering you know specifically flipping rihanna you probably do have to say something especially when it's a rumor so salacious maybe some clarification is needed um pisano later retracted his remarks the fashion blogger tweeted i like to oh yeah let's see his um he's a flipping um statement it's pretty interesting he says as follows this is the blogger who the influencer sorry who put out the uh, rumor that they broke up he read a clarification on the apology that says as follows hi all so i'd like to address the situation last night i made a dumb decision to tweet some information i've received i'm not going to talk about sources blame others for a discussion that was started etc because at the end of the day i made the decision to draft that tweet press send and put out out with my name on it so i'd like to formally apologize to all parties involved um with my actions and for my reckless tweets i fully accept the consequences of my actions for my tweets and any harm they cause i have no excuses for it i've been my i've been way too wrapped up in twitter drama and unfortunately leaned into being messy as a brand which is something going forward i'm going to move away from interesting i'm going to take some time away from twitter to figure out what the looks like and how i can start using my platform better as i've gotten away from using them for more positive work again i apologize to them for this unnecessary drama the only thing i have to say off the back of that is that sometimes if all you have to uh, if all you have to give to the world is mess and drama should you really go back to the drawing board and try to figure out a new way to present yourself to the public when really you don't really have anything else of use to bring to society apart from being messy and a bit, a bit of a chai pay maybe this is a, an example of somebody who can't stand the heat because part of the reason why people like wendy williams is a good example maybe Charlemagne back in the day was a better example um, why they were so successful is that they were able to dance in the fire they were able to you know um resist the urges or the cause to quit or to go away or you're annoying like and just keep powering forward because their brand was based on mess i think jason lee's another good example of it also right there are many attempts at him there are many attempts that kind of come, come across him in terms of getting him out of here and he seems to always kind of ride them i think if you want that to be a brand you have to understand you're gonna get some things wrong 
you're going to call things, you know, may, maybe you've got it right and people don't want to admit it in public, who cares? But you got it wrong in terms of everyone else's general public opinion. And you're also going to have to be aware that you might be the, um, you might end up being um, enemy number one in terms of societally, how you're kind of treated in culture and whatnot, which is also okay. You shouldn't be kind of have a problem with that. Even when it comes to maybe someone stepping to you, or maybe affecting your bag or deals or able to go to certain shows that's all going to be okay i think those consequences are something that you should be able to bear but i feel like maybe nowadays people want everything they want to be able to say the messiest things without consequences and also be invited to all the shows you can't have everything you have to choose your lane and maybe that's the reason why most people in fashion just shut the fuck up and don't say anything because the the kind of rewards of that scene are so coveted that the sort of moral principled um satisfaction you'd get for maybe outing an abuser revealing a rumor um, highlighting injustices and bad practices and abuse whatever it may be it probably just isn't worth it which is a really sad state of affairs to say this but that might be the reason why you don't see more people because the thing is this same guy who did this horrible tweet spreading of what looks like to be a false rumor was also the first person and the only person who came out and said hey daniel lee said something incredibly racist in the meeting one day at bottega veneta which eventually led to him being fired and even then the same community that he was kind of trying to stick up for in the black community no one really backed him up if anything many people were making excuses oh we haven't got proof that daniel lee said the n-word we don't know what's going on people were so hell-bent on making excuses for daniel lee because they loved those fucking puddle boots because Patek Vanessa, Patek, sorry, Patek Vanessa, sorry, was one of the only fashion houses who really went out of their way to lean into black culture and invite as many of people people that look like myself in the scene maybe other brown people to come and sit at their shows participate in clipping advertising and promo and whatnot all of that get gifted stuff in store get discounts i get it but that's the yin and yanga things isn't it on one end he's able to you know blow the casket on that and reveal some interesting topics interesting facts we probably didn't know i think he might have also added some um meat to the story concerning what happened with alexander wang i'm pretty sure but on the flip side he might get some calls wrong as well on that side of things so it's all a bit mad isn't it? it all is a really a bit mad but at the end of it the rumors are not true i guess for the most part they are still together and i don't know maybe maybe it's all, is there a side of things that i think maybe to interpret this maybe there's a group of people out there also who maybe want to see Rihanna miserable is that a thing too does that exist you think you think there's a group for as many people out there who love and adore that woman who want her to have as much success as possible and they want to be near her and they give her all the love they don't care if the album doesn't come out in time and they want to buy all the makeup and whatever it may be there might also be a certain subset of people who legitimately want to see her have a human moment a somewhat regular moment where she seems to in encounter misery pain uh negativity i mean touch wood obviously don't want it to happen to her but I, I wonder if that's the case i wonder if that's what's driving these rumors people actually want to see her miserable so they'd be like you know what let's put out some rumors that everyone else has to go through right because everyone else in the scene who has baby daddies and you know whatnot or these unconventional relationships where it's not maybe you know done in the wedlock or whatnot, whatever it may be they go through drama like she shouldn't be allowed to gallivant around the world you know having this blissful relationship where she's wearing my baby daddy t-shirt she's like, no 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 let's put some bait out there and hope that people bite i don't really know because off the back of this i did remember seeing some screenshots from a random account of some brazilian model who said that um bari contacted her uh Bari basically is using you no know, Rocky was using Bari to contact her to hook up. Who knows if all that stuff is true? But God damn it, man! Like there's no rest in it. Sorry, there's no rest. There's no rest if you're a celebrity. You get all the adulation, all the praise when you're going through such a thing like a pregnancy like this, right? Everyone wants to be around you. They want to get you, you know, get you in their magazine, have sit down for an interview, take candid pictures of you buying really cute baby wares at fucking Target or whatever it may be. But then they also, on the flip side, want to see a human moment. They want to, you know, they just want to see you stumble. They want to see you crumble. They want to see you cry. It's like, God damn, you can't win with some people. You really can't win. Anyway, let's move on from that one. 
let's quickly talk about this this is a pair of new jound new balance sneakers they don't stop just when you thought they're gonna end with their collaboration it looks like new balance for the most part are trying to hmm, what's a change but new balance are doing i think a new approach when it comes to collabs they're aiming for long-term relationships and partnerships as opposed to just one hit wonders one one you know one hit and bang and kind of move on no one night stands when it comes to new balance they're like no you're gonna be my boyfriend by flipping force you're gonna be my boyfriend and clearly john has said yes and i think maybe you're gonna shoot me here but i think these might be the best ones these might be the best ones i've seen from john legitimately outside of the um ridiculously dark navy ones that look almost dark black those are one of my favorites too but in terms of a colorway especially on the model that i'm not really the biggest fan of these are so amazing so these are jammed and new balance 990 version 3 in olive and black and as per usual when it comes to jammed and their collaboration with new balance the thing that really strikes it for me is just the color placements and the use of materials so obviously on yappa you always got to use suede when you're working with new balance there's no other material to use really no one really does opt for leather you don't really see a lot of people going for leather uppers when it comes to working with new i mean in terms of like you know premium levers or tumbled levers or patterns and stuff it's always suedes and kind of new bucks and meshes interesting right but i guess it kind of goes to the models too um you don't want to have an all leather new balance 990 just looks a bit weird in it um but yeah the color placements for me are one of the things that make this really special you got all the olive bits kind of kind of dominating a lot of the upper but then you've got some really touch you got some really clever touches of the black especially around the toe box that kind of accentuates this toe box type shape it doesn't make it all one thing that kind of would make it a little bit too big and make it look too rounded the addition of the black laces again i feel like new balance have some of the best laces in the game out of the box whatever this lace threading is called i love everything about it um you've got a really nice kind of almost is it like what would you call that would you call that an would you call that the olive on the on the end on the inside and it's got a black border with a black on there um, i'm assuming it's probably going to have the jound written on the back of the hill but we can't see the hill and then it's got an entirely black outsole which again reminds me of um sorry midsole and outsole which again reminds me of the mitre sort of um sneakers the kind of japanese collaborations that they used to do back in the day with new balance where a lot of the soles were always kind of one block color um but i love them i really 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 do love them there's no idea on the date so far is there there's one picture here courtesy of jound but we don't have any idea on a date so spring summer 2022 but no idea on a date i feel like going forward is an interesting thing to do in terms of long-term relationships and partnerships because obviously nike don't do that nike always have a bit of a they've always been like this because again i used to work for the company so i can definitely say this with chest that nike have always kind of been a little bit up their own ass in terms of how they approach sneaker collaborations or how they approach sneakers in general maybe only in the last few years they've fully embraced sneaker culture but for the most part they felt like they i won't say despised it but they look they look down on sneakerheads and they even in some cases kind of looked down or took for granted some of their collaborations that they had with sneaker with sort of brands and designers and stuff they were working with collaborations they just took it for granted and usually if you wanted to have a second round as a nike collaborator you didn't get them but nowadays things have changed you think of undefeated they've had a quite a few long-term collaborations unions had a few, quite a few but others have only had a one hit and completely gone so it's interesting to see new balance do a real concentrated effort in terms of collaborating with um Amelion dior jound you would maybe put into the mix stray rats if that makes sense i can't think of anyone else who's really a prominent thing but you know what i mean that they they are obviously going for something there's obviously a plan in mind the only thing i would say is a kind of word of caution they are leaning a lot very very heavily on their sort of quote-unquote retro silhouettes there's not of uh, you know with the exception of salili Bembry, there's not really a lot of innovation going on in their collabs most of the it is just focused on retros and i don't know because i feel like 
if you lean too much into the retro you end up being like nike at the end of the day you are gonna stagnate and just be repeating the hits again and again and again maybe brands want that but i feel like you know nowadays the you know the abundance of dunks and jordans and air maxes just gets boring after a while they don't really make any new interesting shapes and with these other brands out there yeezy being a good example of them pushing the envelope and really challenging consumers and consumers saying hey i'm ready for a new shape like the say what you want about the 350s um or the wave runners or the 700s um they are interesting shapes legitimately interesting shapes and for the most part general public have really lapped kind of lapped them up they've said yeah we like those shoes we like that shape we like the non you know we like the fact that the, the tongue doesn't move the fact that there's no clear logos to tell you what shoe brand this is and stuff like all these really weird things they don't really get on kind of conventional shoes nowadays people kind of really lapped up and i feel like a lot of the bigger sports brands out there don't challenge the consumer enough they just kind of give them what they want not really because they just tell you it's limited when it's not limited and they backdoor some stuff and whatnot but in general they they kind of give them what they want and just stay in that safe space they know what works they know what sells out they know what gets the cues they know what generates the clicks and that's it they don't want to challenge anything else other than that and i feel like it just becomes very stale very quickly because there's only so many jordan ones dunks air force ones one man can buy and two it's like okay how much more do you know what I mean like enough's enough like even Pata look what Pata had to do with the MX1 Pata had to flip in completely wavify the mud guards and make it far more interesting of a shoe because they've already done everything with that fucking shoe um I feel like you know maybe New Balance should maybe be cautious of that and if they are going to have this long-term partnership approach with these brands and designers why not just have them do some interesting things every other season instead of having it just be the you know models we already know why not just introduce new shapes and new silhouettes via those brands have that be the cheat way like most brands do right most brands or nike being a, a good one as well before in the past they test retros with collabs um sorry one big example of them being comme des garçons they'd usually test some interesting shapes and silhouettes with Comme des Garçons and let them do those avant-garde, you know, applications of it. If it gets, if it becomes successful, it drops down to a tier zero, it goes to GR, whatever it may be, right? An LE, whatever. Those, those options are really still there, but I hope they do that going forward, New Balance. So, so it's not just a standard thing where it's always a 990s. Um, it's always the 574 it's always this like let's like let's move it out let's shake up a little bit because even at the moment with those new balance alds um 5550s i'm already getting bored of that shit already as well so i want to see some interesting things going forward but again i can't be mad at these new balance um 990 version threes from jound they're obviously going to come out soon most of us won't be able to get them but that is the way things are moving on from that we have of course some promo material um, regarding Salili Bembry's new balances that are due to be coming out on April 22nd. Um, this is courtesy of New Balance Social Club on Instagram showing some promo material of the shoes. So far from everything I've seen regarding the trainers when it comes to the marketing material, when it comes to the lookbooks for some of the clothing that he did, it's all perfect. The videos, it's all great. It's just the shape of the shoe looks very bulbous and very ugly compared to what it initially looked like that's the only thing that's putting me off about the shoe and again i'm not too sure if it looks different in real life but from what i see in the pictures and seeing people wearing them and little clips here and there they just don't look as great as they looked initially and it's a shame because if anything it kind of feels like the sneaker version of like a or like a kodak black snippet or something or like a trippy red snippet it sounds amazing 30 seconds 50 seconds but in the moment you get the full thing it's like oof, this isn't that great in it and maybe this is what's happening with these um what are they the yurts right the yurt um new balance i think it's called the yurt i'm not really too sure but yeah you meant to have a whistle on the back of it when you go camping and shit if you want to scare away polar bears but um yeah they just they just look a bit funny for me i don't know what they are they look a bit weird in terms of how bulbous they are um and you know what also about it that's really a bit of a shame they're kind of giving sketches if that makes sense it's giving sketches right it's giving um cardio mom it's giving zumba well or am i or am i or am i freaking out here i don't know because my favorite color out of the pack is definitely this black and purple one 
right? I'd wear the hell out of that. Um, black, purple, whatever, grey. And of course, this colorway reminds me of old Air Maxes and also kind of um, women's new balances in terms of the purple, pinky hits on them. But I can't lie, they do look a bit sketchy. And I don't know if people actually want to wear sketches or if people are designing sketch shoes in homage of sketches or they're trying to make them more interesting or they're trying to jump on this whole thick sole ugly shoe trend thing going on at the moment but i don't know man just don't look that great that's the only issue in these pictures maybe it'll look better in person you know when i see someone actually wearing them in real life by that time it'll be too late to actually cop a pair but still i'm really not fond of them i'm not sold at all in the slightest what people say in the comments here versus on this instagram it says when i die uh bury me next to two yurts another person says these are dope but come on the odds of getting the pair are stupid the bots already got every pair in every car right now okay shut up you're complaining about stuff you haven't even tried to buy yet dickhead um the green ones are fire yeah i agree the green color is quite nice actually the colorways are perfect one thing we can't deny salili Benbury, he has a expert kind of level um of application or delivery when it comes to flipping putting colorways together from the from the crocs that he did to this to the jackets to the clothing like his ability to even when you think of the chain reactions the early colorways that like the colorways are really good forget if you don't like the shoes the colorways are banging and i think he always usually gets it right when it comes to colors of his shoes i think all of them um are shoes that i think people would definitely be fans of especially general uh, you'd say your normie kind of general public sort of person another person says i really shouldn't but i might just have to another one says anyone know what their sizing is like uh another person oh stop it instagram what's wrong with you says i love these another person says beautiful sneakers congratulations to everyone who has opportunity to grab them unfortunately the bots will eat them so people cry about bots on social media before they've even tried to buy them bruv i don't know what's worse posting a picture of an l because people do this a lot people post pictures of l's that they got like a screenshot from like a end or a screenshot from sneakers or whatever app it is it's like what are you doing bruv that's as lame as people who scrub their flipping tweets and then put them up on their instagram feed or their ig stories like do you not have parents do you not have any shame are you not embarrassed like legitimately you're not embarrassed that you're having to flip in screenshot your tweets to show everyone how smart and funny you are or how poignant your fucking dumbass opinion was like mellow out man another person says let's go another person says need instrumental beats for up and coming pro oh shut up man imagine putting up imagine putting your link to your instrumentals as a flipping text on a comment well, you want me to copy and paste that link and put it in my search bar you're absolutely having a flipping wobbler you are mate and that person says damn that's how y'all do basically stock x exclusives that's funny that's funny <laughs> because that's what i usually do nowadays i don't even bother signing up for raffles <clears throat> if i know i want something i have a budget set in place of how much i'm willing to spend and just see how much it go for on raff on stock x if it's with my budget i just buy them straight away I don't bother doing the whole oh let me click follow this account leave a comment share it retweet it so you have a chance to get a man go fuck yourself jump off a flipping cliff really if you think i'm gonna do that for a pair of sneakers man nah this is just sick barbara so everyone likes them the black pair so so far it looks like i'm the only person who thinks they look a bit mad irl vis-a-vis -vis the early images we saw of them um, they don't look as great but maybe those are maybe the first samples i don't really know but so far everyone online seems to love them i seem to be the only one that's basically not a fan so as per usual you know what do i know what do i know but yeah these are coming out what april 22nd so if you're a fan keep an eye out for them if you're not you probably wouldn't care anyway innit? you probably wouldn't care anyway let's move on from that what else we to talk about here oh yeah this is the one so i was saying earlier that i was getting really bored of the ami leon Dawn new balance five uh sorry 650s or the even the 550s that shape overall I was just getting tired of it and then you see it on the front cover of jack harlow's album for well, his up and coming album coming out he's wearing a pair of five five fifties or me five five zeros it's like oh yeah yeah most likely he's going to put a bump in the sales of these shoes so we're going to see them even more and it's like enough already man enough but maybe i'm maybe i'm the one that's the 
uh, maybe I'm the exception in this, in that I'm the only one that maybe doesn't want to see them. Everyone else does. Might be too short. <clears throat> Let's get them up on the screen. So this is the pair. It's courtesy of high piece and it's sorry, it's courtesy of high snobiety. And this is the following. Uh let's get them up on here. Sorry, not M550. There's just I'm in Dior's new balance 650 RS again. Um total basketball shoe. It says here this follows. Brand a million Dior and New Balance. The model is a 650R. A release date is April 19th. Price $165, which isn't too bad. It says the follows. <coughs> So it says the following um a surprise non 5550 new balance offering on april 7th a million dollars back um teasing us again with a new balance 650r collab these aren't the a million door 550s everyone's been waiting for but they'll have to do for now so in some weird twist of event they've decided to put out the highs before they put out the lows hmm i wonder why interesting choice in it you would imagine but anyway, we continue um it says the 650s aren't entirely new save the fresh red colorway as the green gray and navy options dropped pre-order in july 2021 so only one colorway is brand new okay what's the point of that showing up the collab latest rollout for a 650r simply marks the shoe's official launch since its pre-order they've been fucking no a eh? million dollar like the they're definitely the newer version of flipping vince I mean, they're so long-winded and <coughs> unnecessary in their flipping drops in it 2021 and the only other color is coming out only now i wonder if that's to do with the whole like um thing going on with covid with the uh what's that term they use about you know when they can't ship things to certain places and things are stuck in flipping containers in different places i wonder if that's an issue supply chain was that you reckon it's a supply chain issue? Because that's a bit weird, isn't it? The other colorways come out in 2021 and this final colorway is only coming out now. Like, God damn. But because people like hype so much, there's so many adult hype beasts out there, they're definitely still going to sell out. It says as follows. While Emmy Leon Dor New Balance 650R is obviously not the collab 550s we all want, it definitely channels the big 5550 energy. So, 550 energy, not 5550. Um, with its simplistic color palette and overall shape. I wonder, is it blasphemy to say that most likely, because of Ami Leon Dor's Ami Leon Dor's price point, even though they have very young, youthful energy about it, it's definitely a brand for old people who want to pretend like they're young, isn't it? It feels like it. You know, like you know like those older dudes that wear palace, <clears throat> non non ironically. Like, cause it's, you know you still want to feel like you're one of the kids that like you're down and everything or you wear polo because you want to feel down with the kids or whatever new trendy brand is out there that exists maybe that's the same thing with um aod these older dudes who don't mind who, who can't afford to drop a thousand quid on a flipping cardigan are the only ones that are going to be able to afford the cardigan because of the high price point and it's also going to afford them the opportunity to look cool and down with the kids because you know you can't wear a you can't wear aod clothes without looking youthful without putting on the bucket hat a bucket hat sorry and rolling up your trousers and having a carabiner hanging off your jeans and you know talking in that weird hipster voice i don't know you know what i mean maybe that's the case with it but i just i don't get it personally i think it's fine don't get me wrong it's cool it's very well presented it sort of looks like the it's perfection really in terms of their ability to construct and put together garments but i just don't get the um, fanfare around it personally it just doesn't necessarily it's as much as it's impressive to look at or to the eye i don't feel like it's really really ultimately desirable in a weird way does that make any sense it just doesn't seem like a brand you want to cover it looks good. Line sheets look amazing. Great look books. Those two black models they use, they they wear the clothes fucking perfect. They're the perfect muses for the brand, for sure. But in terms of it being clothing that you just can't not have in your life, like you have to get the new AOD. I don't think if it I don't think it bangs the same way like Noah does. Even though Noah's stuff isn't as good as it was when they first started, or maybe in a few years ago, it's kind of gone downhill a bit. I still feel like nowhere is still more covetable. It's still something people want to save up for, or they're sitting at home waiting for the new collection to drop because they want to get that anorak, or they want to get that, you know, gile, or they want to get a pair of shorts, whatever. But I don't see the same thing happen with LD. Maybe I'm looking too deep into it. I'm not really too sure, but 
I just feel like there's a lot of I don't know, a lot of fugazi going on with that brand personally, but maybe I'm reading too much into it. Anyway, it continues. It says the 650R sneaker features the collaboration Snee signature mesh leather clutch on the upper, resting upon a rubber outsole. The shoes oozes cozy, cozy vibe, and I'm talking um, um, aesthetically and physically. The 650R's plush um, high top ankle appears to supply immense comfort, while the shoes EVA capsule guarantees support gear during a daily flex or game time. Is it blasphemy? You know, I just thought of. Is it blasphemy to say? that aod for me is like a more sophisticated version of sporty and rich like that sporty and rich girl actually had good taste and could actually has talent if she actually had talent to design good things and actually had you know a high level of taste and maybe put some actual money into producing high quality garments maybe it could look as good as aod but aod maybe is the is the boss is the final boss of sporty and rich type people like you know the kind of person that'll stand next to a range rover they don't own because it's got it's green with brown interior you know what i mean like i don't know man i don't know i don't know there's just something about it and the fact that they just keep turning out these same fucking dead new bands i'm like yeah, come on enough brothers anyway speaking of game time the ld um 650rs arrives just on time to collab with the Masaryk Community Gym, which was announced in the public on April 8th, 17th, with a mural by Jacob Rochester. I don't know where that is. Is that in New York or something? I'm not really too sure. I'm not going to click the link because my computer's going to crash. Um, fellow Amelia and your fans will know I've gotten your hopes up twice now, but sure enough, the AOD New Balance 650Rs isn't to be slept on. <laughs> just think of it like this now your 550s won't be alone you do well imagine writing this type of copy professionally you won't be lonely your shoes won't be lonely are you having are you having me on mate are you really having me on anyway um they're gonna be out soon if you want them you know keep an eye out if you don't i guess don't it is what it is, isn't it what do i know what do i care let's move on where's my computer man <clears throat> let's get rid of that Bit of me a second. Gonna move on from here a bit. The 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 what's I got here to talk about? I need to talk about it quickly. Bear with me. <coughs> oh yeah, it's talk about it. it's quickly, isn't it? <coughs> I'm on work. So this is courtesy of Hype Beast. As I mentioned earlier on my podcast, these um Tiger and Mischief Wavy Baby sneakers that dropped recently um have unfortunately it looks like had a cease and desist being put out to them via vans. I guess cease and desist or maybe they're just suing mischief out in general. Because like I mentioned previously in my clip of the show for the podcast. <clears throat> I don't feel like these are a real deviation from Vans old school at all. They basically look like a Vans old school, but they basically warped them. There is no real difference to what Vans do in terms of how these look. Not discernibly enough anyway, I don't think. So it's no surprise that they're saying allegedly that Vans are suing them. So let's read the article. It says as follows. Today, Vans has filed a lawsuit against Mischief for its wavy baby sneaker that closely resembles a Vans old school silhouette. Mischief's new shoe in collaboration with Tiger made its debut last week, catching the eyes of many due to its clear nod to the Vans' most signature shoes. <coughs> Sorry. Although the wavy baby sneaker remixes a shoe with thick wave life platform sole, um, whose design reverberates through the other sole, paneling, construction, and colorway still mirror Vans' work. This whole idea about remix that's not a remix bruv you're just taking an already existing shoe and making it warped like do something original with the shoe remix you know the lawsuit claims a trademark infringement um a false designation of the origin and unfair competition in addition to a trademark dilution um dil dilution sorry the number of violations extends to mischiefs copying of vans trademarks with the shoe designs advertising and packaging definitely because i showed you the packaging everything it looks like a van they didn't even try to make it um different than what a van's like if, if you again if, if you put that on a shelf at a flipping office or a size regular folk would just think it's a limited edition van like a collab of some sort they wouldn't think it's an entirely different shoe brand <clears throat> it says as follows Mischief in collaboration with Mr. Stevenson 
has shamelessly marked <laughs> marketed the wavy baby shoe in a direct effort to confuse consumers unlawfully siphon sales from vans and unintentionally damage vans valuable intellectual property rights the lawsuit claims the wavy baby shoe blatantly and unmistakably incorporate vans iconic trademarks and tra trade dress this is exactly the same thing that's happening with flipping john geiger in it but john geiger's sitting here legitimately shouting at everybody and arguing that he basically has a right to copy you know the most popular shoe design in history and quote unquote make it his own by doing a little squig on the side but again regular people you put that shoe up in size in office in flipping sns most regular people wouldn't know that's not nike they'll just assume it is a nike but it's just a collaboration so if it already looks too much like a nike shoe you probably should just make your own shoe from the ground up and i, get, I don't get these people if you've got all this manufacturing abilities and abilities to basically produce and make these shoes to that sort of level of finish and it look pretty decent in the hand and on the foot in terms of construction why not just make an original shoe why waste your time just basically reverse engineering a shoe that already exists with the lawsuit all that nonsense you have to go through in terms of paying money all that whatever it is just to have a shoe that looks like something already is out there that already exists what it basically proves to me is that most of these people don't really have any real level of creativity they're not really pushing the envelope they just want to be kind of safe because these are as much as they are a bit outlandish looking they are ridiculously safe because they do still look like a regular vans it's not like they're going out there making a really crazy out there shape that really changes people's perception of what a shoe is meant to look like no there's just a standard vans that's been run through the warp setting somewhere right in fucking photoshop it just i don't know i'm just not i'm not jacking it i'm not feeling it whatsoever but of course i'm the exception here because according to Ryder rips who may or may not be the person responsible for designing this monstrosity they allegedly sold out in 10 minutes that's what he's saying now this could be cap this could be a way of them kind of deflecting the flipping pending lawsuit and wanting to basically rid themselves of the shoes before they have to face the music in court i don't really know but i'm also not surprised because if anything I've learned over the last few years, especially when it comes to ugly sneakers, this ugly sneaker trend, especially for people who wear them kind of to be ironic and whatnot, it's mostly for people I feel like who don't have any personality. If you're lacking personality and you kind of, um, you kind of, uh, you kind of add personality via vis-a-vis -vis the clothes you wear, the shoes you wear, the music you listen to, the places you go to, one of the cheat ways to immediately get some form of personality is to wear loud shit to wear crazy hats um to put on crazy shoes to have crazy jeans holes everywhere patches all this shit because it immediately makes you look like somebody who's interesting somebody's worth talking to that you've got a crater bone in your body that you're into cool interesting things that you've been to cool interesting places and blah 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 when really you're not you're a bit dense there's nothing really about you interesting at all apart from the crazy shoes that you decided to legitimately wear and go out and about in and yeah i wouldn't be caught dead in these things like they're just terrible but of course i'm the exception because there's this video courtesy of who is celebrity vice or some kids on a train wearing the wavy babies on a somewhat wavy skateboard basically feeling like they're the coolest guys in the world one of them is eating a pack of christmas surprise and not flaming hot cheetos to kind of tap into the cringy marketing going on online of course he's wearing some sort of fluorescent yellow stupid do-rag a flame bomber jacket hoodie thing it's just like come that's the type of person you're competing with a person who wears leather pants with those horrendous vans a flame varsity jacket and is eating a big pack of family size lays on the train on the way to work somewhere that's who you're basically aligning yourself with by wearing these monstrosities absolutely terrible shoes disgustingly awful i hate everything about them I literally hate everything about them i hope van sues and they win <laughs> fuck off next on the list to end it we have this interesting news courtesy of the internet it looks like um julia fox has now become the 
new de facto model for supreme going forward maybe she might be the new it hot girl they have in some of the ads which i'm down for and which i'm a big fan of this is courtesy of Inst it, the twitter that i've actually found or stumbled across i think some other people have posted it but it's an advertising campaign a poster they've put around in different places uh, which features julia fox sat on the lap i think of tyshawn or somebody i'm not too sure um they're on a, a faux plane going somewhere and she's got basically an air stewardess um, outfit on and i have to be honest i actually prefer this version of julia fox than the high fashion version of julia fox i think high fashion julia fox come across a bit too try hard um i feel like the julia fox that we all kind of know in the scene is the person that was obviously featured on uncut gems a person that was a somewhat you know for lack of a better term was an art ho and somebody who was legitimately it far more interesting than most actresses that we see out and about in it in culture at the moment because she actually lived an interesting life has some interesting stories was a practicing artist herself in some respects and just somebody who was like kind of girl about town circling in the culture doing a thing obviously things changed when she got into acting and started doing that properly and maybe if we weren't in the pandemic was she able to kind of really promote herself after uncut gems come out she could have gone a different route but of course having a kid probably changed things also but i just think in general aesthetically in terms of her look and her appeal being a white lady with with, you know fat tits and a big bum aligning yourself with streetwear and being a sort of art ho kind of person is a far more in tune with her brand than chasing the fashion people they're a bit i won't say vapid but they're a little bit seasonal in their love because they're only kind of cut you know they're only basically trying to um you know leech off of her relative stardom of the being connected with kanye because she's connected with kanye but after a while they're going to get bored of her and move on but I feel like if she was a bit more in line with whatever you call this side of things in streetwear, she would have a far more fruitful and probably beneficial career going forward. You can easily see her becoming, you know, involved in working with some of these brands behind the scenes, maybe starting her own thing. I don't know. There's more, I feel like, avenues that she could go in if she decided to really lean into the you know creative scene kind of thing as opposed to going to the fashion route things and ultimately again she's not wearing anything supreme i don't think from this shoot she's just wearing a kind of a faux air stewardess outfit but i think she fits the stuff far better than she would fit anything in terms of high fashion personally for me the best looks that she's come out of really in that kind of scene has been the diesel type looks which you would assume or i could easily say are a lot you know our kind of streetwear influence in terms of the denim and the casual clothing but not what you know whatever you call it but i don't necessarily think she looks the greatest when it comes to this fashiony fashiony with the capital f things maybe that's just me but um yeah i like this i love this and this also might be um the first evidence that we see of tremaine's um creative director reign that he's now you know newly appointed the creative director of supreme this might be one of the first pieces of content we see um that he maybe has had a hand in producing because this feels very zeitgeist it feels very of the moment somebody that's kind of tapped in and kind of observing culture and is able to maybe pull people you know it's maybe maybe able to kind of give people a platform and maybe put them on a pedestal that people maybe aren't seeing them on maybe people see her as as uh, just a kind of a fame hungry whore or something but maybe he's able to kind of see it through the lens that we're seeing it through and say no nah, she's somebody that people should rate some people should respect the hustle and somebody that people kind of stand and yeah here's how we're going to present her we're going to throw this narrative out there they're, they're putting this spin on her we're going to put this spin um, and maybe this is what we're seeing or maybe this is just what they're always planning to do in the first place and i'm reading too much into it i don't know but also the end point of it to end this podcast on allegedly there is news courtesy of the interwebs that now supreme are due to open up a second store in london so not only are they've got the main store i don't know where it is i don't know where it is is it in soho wherever it is right it's in soho i've only been there a couple of times in my life actually to be honest but they're gonna open another one in london as well so clearly um the whole idea that supreme is dying or it's on the downward trend has been you know greatly exaggerated because they keep opening more stores um they keep you know going from success to success they keep signing new people they keep hiring new people and they just keep chugging along like a relentless consistent um, machine that they are and i think in general why are they able to do that is because they put the right people in the right position and it kind of basically runs itself after that if you put people in the right position in there and you have 
um, a real solid foundation. The codes of Supreme are basically engraved. Um, you know, anyone that's a fan of the brand can essentially kind of get it in terms of what they want to do and what they want to put out. And as long as the people that you're putting in there have the right ideas and the right vision and the right application, you're going to be fine. And I think that's what basically they're doing now with this brand. And I can't wait to see how they end up evolving in the next 10 to 20 years, because clearly now it's not the brand that I grew up loving in terms of it being my little secret that I kind of kept from my friends and no one actually knew about it because it's the most, you would say probably the most popular street, rare, the po most popular street rare brand in the world, right? There was a time when Bape was that brand, um, but definitely Supreme has have, have surpassed them, you know, 10 times over, especially with the level of consistency and the fact that James has been, James JB has been the main person in charge and he's kind of kept a tight rein on things, even though they've got investments and people felt like they're diluting a the brand. Me personally, I feel like there's been a lot of dilution in terms of the logos splayed all over the clothing, like stuff like this, whoever that model is wearing, sorry, whoever that model is wearing the jacket sitting down um, with the Supreme on the back, I feel like in years gone by, that would have been a one or two piece thing in the collection. But nowadays there's at least more than 10 pieces in the collection that have Supreme splayed on the chest, on the backs or the shoulders, somewhere along the side of the leg. It's all a bit much, but of course that's because, you know, there's a whole new different consumer base out there ready and willing to buy that shit. And they want to have, they want people to know they're wearing Supreme. So I get that side of things, but you know, maybe that's the only style of things that I'm not really a fan of, but everything else I love, and I can't wait to see more of this. Now, again, this, I think I'm not mistaken, this was uh, taken by legendary um, photographer and director Harmony Corrine. So hopefully we're going to see more stuff from him too with Supreme going forward. Anyway, that is the Action Zing Show episode number, was it? 571. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time checking out my show, make sure, you know, you do the right thing and just help me out in terms of all the links, all that good stuff. If it isn't your first time checking out the show, then thanks again for coming back. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace.